Good afternoon, Plato members, Skirball Cultural Center community, and guests. We are here for the final colloquium of this fiscal year for us. We, we will begin again in September, the third Thursday of the month, so, so we have a new year coming up. For our guests who are here, uh, we are pleased to open this to the public, and be free parking, it's hard to argue with. Tell your friends, but also know that Plato has a great many things that we offer our members. Our core function is our study discussion group. Uh, three terms, usually 14 weeks, we create 70 courses in a year, and and that's the, that's, the big, that's the big cheese. But there are a great many other things that we also do. We have day trips, we have an annual retreat, and we have a whole host of things that we do on Fridays. There's an opera group, there's play reading, there's adventures in aging, there are political discussions, there are hot topics. So look us up online if you're not a member of Plato and we would be happy to see you. I'm going to turn it over to Hank Zangwell, who will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Nancy, and I also extend my welcome to everybody. I think there's little doubt that the 2016 election was one of the most unique that most of us have gone through. And I can't think of anybody who's more qualified to discuss it with you than our speaker today. Professor Lynn Vavrick is the Marvin Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA and a contributing editor to the New York Times or a contributing columnist to the US, to the New York Times. Professor Vavrick teaches um, courses and writes about campaigns, elections, and public opinion. She holds an MS and a PhD in political science from the University of Rochester, and has previously worked at Princeton University, Dartmouth College, and the White House. She received her bachelor's degree and, her, and a master's degree in political science from Arizona State University where she studied with our own Peter McDonough. Professor Vavrick is a 2015 Andrew Carnegie Award winner and is the recipient of multiple um, grants from the National Science Foundation and awards for her work in political advertising. She has published four books. Uh, which include The Message Matters, which Stanley Greenberg called required reading for presidential candidates, the, and The Gamble, which was described by Nate Silver as the definitive account of the 2012 election. Professor Vavrick has served on advisory boards of the British and American National Election Studies and is the co-founder of the Cooperative Campaign Analysis Project. Please join me in welcoming Professor Vavrick. Thank you all so much. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, I see so many familiar faces, so I already feel at home among all of you. And um, while we're just uh, queuing up here, I'm gonna take the microphone out. This is maybe gonna make some noise, so I apologize in advance, because I'm gonna get out of the way a little bit so that you can see some of the things that I have brought to show you today. So for the next half hour, 35 minutes or so, we are going to talk about what happened in 2016. Um, it is what I call the identity crisis, the battle for the meaning of America. So we're gonna talk a little bit about identity, 
That will mean talking about race and religion and ethnicity. We will talk about Trump voters. We'll talk about Rubio and Bush and McCain voters from 08 and also Clinton voters uh, from 2016 and 2008. Um, sometimes these topics are emotional for people. So just wanna, this is not really a trigger warning, but I just wanna let everyone know um, what's coming. And of course, there are people in the room who have voted for all of these candidates. Um, so we not only want our conversation today to be informative, but also, of course, respectful of everyone in the room. Um, so I want to start this uh, now provocative conversation um, that I've previewed for you by talking about these two gentlemen. This is Rakeem Jones. And Rakeem Jones never saw it coming. That's where I want to start this conversation. What he never saw coming was a swift punch in the gut from this man, John McGraw. So both Rakeem Jones and John McGraw found themselves in Fayetteville, North Carolina at a Donald Trump campaign rally. John McGraw, McGraw was there supporting the candidate. Rakeem Jones was there with some other friends of his from Black Lives Matter protesting the candidate. Donald Trump was at the podium and you all know, you can think back to those quotes that have been repeated over and over, saying things like, see those guys in the back? You know what we did to guys like that in the old days? If you see one of them, just punch them. I'll pay your legal fees. So John McGraw did punch <laughs> Rakeem Jones. Donald Trump did not pay his legal fees. But what happened after the punch was interesting. Rakeem Jones, who was being escorted out of the hall by police at the time, fell to the floor, as one does when one gets punched unexpectedly. But nobody saw what had happened. People didn't understand why he was falling to the floor. So the security just kind of scooped him up and escorted him out, even though he was saying, someone hit me, someone hit me. Nobody knew who threw the punch. After the rally, just by luck, one of the cable networks was asking people, what'd you think of the rally? What'd you think of the rally? And they happened on John McGraw, whose quick name, uh, nickname, by the way, is Quick Draw McGraw. So <laughs> you'll, you'll often hear him referred to in the media as Quick Draw McGraw. So they happened on him and they said, hey, how'd you like the rally? And he said, I loved it. And they said, what did you love about it? And he said, my favorite part is when I clocked that guy. So he outed himself on national television. The next day, police showed up at his door and um, charged him with assault. So in that interview though, they asked John McGraw, why did you hit that man? And this is what he said. He said, ah, there we go. <laughs> Ooh, wait, nope, okay. Le okay, let's try that one more time. You want me to wait? Okay, <laughs> he said, I hit him because we don't know if he's ISIS. We don't know who he is. The next time we see him, we may have to kill him. So John McGraw is a retired man living in North Carolina and he is spending his retirement years working with leather. He loves leather work, he makes belts, he makes bookmarks, all kinds of things that he gives to his friends. Um, that he's making in his workshop at his home. It is my, why do I start with this story? Because it's my belief that this interaction between these two men is really a metaphor for the whole campaign. John McGraw did not go to that Donald Trump rally that day thinking, I'm gonna hit some guy and get arrested. He did it because something the candidate said at that rally encouraged him, provoked him, activated him to respond this way. And that's going to be the theme for the whole rest of this presentation. That 2016 was really unique because of things the candidates said. In particular today I'm going to talk about Donald Trump. Things that Donald Trump said in his campaign provoked reactions in people that are unique to 2016. And that's the data, I'm gonna show you lots of data about that and, um, and then we can talk about it as we go along. Okay, we'll come back to these two guys at the end. All right, so do you think I have to be pointing this at you? Okay, all right, so here we go, let's test it. 
Perfect, okay, we'll remember to do that, okay. <laughs> so the motivating question then is, and the mystery I think for a lot of people is how do we go from this president to this president? How does that happen? Okay, so that's the story that I wanna tell, is that this is a, this is a long story. Um, it doesn't start in 2016 with Donald Trump. It doesn't even really start with Barack Obama in 2008. Okay, I'll try this again. All of this is represented in a book that I have written on the 2016 election, which will come out in October. So it's a, going through copy editing right now, um, but it's called Identity Crisis. And I have co-authored that with um, two colleagues of mine, one from UC Irvine and one from George Washington University. So I wanna give them some credit here for the work that I'm about to show you. Okay, so a couple things right off the bat. 2016 in many ways was an unusual election in all the ways that you guys can think of. The candidates are a little unusual. The way that they raised and spent money is unusual. The role of elites kind of being ignored in the Republican primary is unusual. Lots of unusual things. But in a whole lot of other ways, 2016 was quite a typical election. The role of the economy, the role of party identification, and the role of predisposition, uh, predispositions or attitudes about race and religion and ethnicity. Those things all are going to play a very typical role in 2016. So we wanna appreciate both how it's different and how it's the same. So the story about 2016 goes back to probably around 2000, maybe even a little bit before. And what is happening in those early years of the 2000s is politics is nationalizing. Even our midterm congressional elections, which really used to be driven by local matters, by who that incumbent member of Congress was, those are becoming more and more nationalized. They're all about the same thing, no matter where in the country the congressional district is. So the congressional politics is starting to nationalize and the parties are starting to get more homogenous. Now a lot of that is because the South, after the civil rights movement, is slowly resorting itself back into the Republican Party. So we don't have Southern Democrats who are conservative anymore, those Southerners are Republicans. And that really makes the parties nationally look more homogenous. But as they become more, homogen more homogenous, they're sending a stronger signal to people everywhere about what it means to be a Republican or be a Democrat. So people are now more clearly seeing if they're in the wrong party. Oh, I, I belong in that other party. So people are sorting too at the same time. So the parties are getting more homogenous and as you probably have recognized if you pay any attention to Congress, they are also separating, becoming farther apart ideologically, at least in Congress. So all that is happening in the early 2000s. And then a key turning point for this separation and signaling about what parties stand for comes in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama. And what that election did was help a lot of people in the population realize what the Democratic Party stood for or some things about the Democratic Party that they maybe didn't know before Obama was elected. Okay, so we're gonna basically work through this in four parts. First, we're gonna talk about setting the stage, this stuff that I've been talking about. Where's the landscape for 2016 come from? Then, we'll talk a little bit about how Donald Trump leveraged existing attitudes and activated them. He didn't create the attitudes, he just woke them up a little bit. We'll talk about how identity issues mattered in 2016 relative to previous presidential elections. And more in 2016 when Donald Trump is the Republican relative to Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or Kasich or any of the others. And then finally, just a little bit at the end about how his focus on these racially and religious and ethnically inflected issues, these identity issues, refracted all of the other things in the campaign, including education and the economy, some basic bread and butter things that always matter. But they matter a little bit differently in 2016. So that's what we're gonna work through here in the next little bit. 
Okay, so setting the stage, how does that 2008 election of Barack Obama help people learn that the Democratic Party should be associated with equality and to aid to minorities? And then what does that have to do with setting us up for 2016? Okay. Sometimes it likes me and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, here we go. So what I'm showing you here is data from a big election study that the federal government funds that goes way back in time to the 1940s. I'm going to start in 1988 when they started asking this question, can you put the Democratic Party and the Republican Party next to each other in the appropriate space on the question of which party is more supportive to blacks. Okay, so aid to blacks and more on one side, less on the other side, and which party is on which side. So how many people can correctly place the parties with respect to this um, question? And I'm showing you here the white bars are the answers from 1988 to 2004. And I've got it broken out for you, people who have no college education and people who have a college education. So here you can see that 42% of the non-college educated people, this is a national sample, between 1988 and 2004, 42% can place the Democratic Party on the correct side of this issue relative to the Republican Party. And here's the value of a college education. Okay, so 75% of the folks with a college education were correctly able to place Democrats and Republicans on this issue. So that's a big shift. Okay, now, the next thing I'm gonna show you is the answers to these questions in the gray bar 2008 and then 2012. Okay, so just now looking at the non-college educated respondents, not much is happening over here really, but you can see in 2008 after Barack Obama is elected president, a, a big increase. 13 percentage points more um, people can put the Democrats on the correct side of this issue. And then by Obama's second term, it's a 22 point jump in people's abilities to correctly place the Democrats and Republicans on aid to minorities or questions about equality. So the election of Barack Obama, a black man to the White House, was worth almost as much as a college education. It's not the whole way to 75, we're not at 75 yet. But it, it closed a lot of the gap um, in the value of a college education for the non-college educated people. They learned by associating Barack Obama with the Democratic Party, Barack Obama being black, that the Democratic Party must be better for blacks. A very, a very simple reality observation. So it matters who these candidates are. In this case, it is just who Barack Obama is. It also matters what they say. Okay, and that's where we're gonna get to Donald Trump in a moment. So candidates influence what people know and how they use what they know in elections. Now what I'm showing you here is, again, that same long study of presidential elections starting in 1988 and going to 2008. And I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures that look like this, so we'll take a minute just to get the lay of the land. On the y-axis, the vertical axis here, I'm always showing you vote for the Republican or vote for Donald Trump when we get to 2016. Vote for the Republican. Here on the x-axis, I've got a measure of racial attitudes. It's a summary of four questions asking people um, agree or disagree. Generations of slavery have made it hard for African Americans to work their way up. Um, if blacks tried harder, they'd be just as well off as whites. It's a series of questions asking about work ethic and experience and race. So on the left side, on your left side, are people with the lowest level of racial anxiety, and then on the right side, people with the highest levels. And all I want you to take away from this smattering of graphs is that these racial attitudes, racial animus or anxiety or just basically views about race, have always played a role in presidential elections. Okay, this is not about one party, it happens in both parties, it happens for people who call themselves independents, but the more 
conservative your racial views are, the more you vote for the Republican candidate. Okay, so you can see it in 1988, in 92, in 2000. It's happening election after election. In 2008, we get to observe what people say in a McCain-Hillary Clinton matchup for president and a McCain-Barack Obama matchup. And you can see that these racial attitudes play more of a role in 2008 when we ask about Obama relative to Clinton. That makes sense. Okay, but the important takeaway is that these attitudes always play a role. They've been in place a long time. Donald Trump is not, he didn't create them. He is going to, you can see how um, Obama activates them in 08. Donald Trump is going to activate them in 2016 more than Obama did in 8 or 12. Okay, so it matters who the candidates are. But people always say to me, hey, Lynn, that doesn't make any sense. How could people who voted for Barack Obama vote for Donald Trump? Okay, and this is, again, I'm going to repeat myself. It matters who the candidates are and what they say. Okay, because here, I want you to look at this set of numbers. These are white Obama voters from 2012. I was able to interview um, about 45,000 people in 2011 and 2012 and 2015, and then I pushed and was able to interview about 10,000 of them again in 2016. Same people. So what I'm showing you here are results from this collection of people who tell me things about themselves in 2011 and 12. And these are their views on questions like, um, should it be harder for people to immigrate to the United States in 2011? Okay, so 34% of white Barack Obama voters in 2011 said, yeah, it should be harder. In 2011, how many white Obama voters rated Muslims less favorable on a 0 to 100 scale? So they're rating them 50 or lower, 35%. Um, they, how many believe illegal immigrants are mostly a drain on society? A third of white Obama voters in 2011 said I illegal immigrants are a drain on society. Okay, so why are they, why? Why does that happen? People are mis, not mismatched, but they don't share necessarily the same views as the candidate on these issues. Because in 2012, if you remember, how important were questions about immigration in 2012? They were not a big part of the campaign. Mitt Romney said self-deportation like once, and that was it. They didn't talk about it, because mostly they agreed. Candidates tend not to talk about the issues on which they both agree. They're going to split the votes on those issues. They don't want that. So in 2012, you have all these white Obama voters who are mismatched with the Democratic Party on this particular issue, an issue that then Donald Trump is going to come in in 2016 and activate and scoop some of these voters away. Okay, so it isn't the case that just because people voted for Barack Obama in 8 and 12, there's no way they could possibly have voted for Donald Trump. The data suggests, in fact, something um, very different. I mean, we could talk about the race ones too, but how many white Obama voters agreed with the statement that blacks should work their way up without any special favors? Almost half. Okay, so. This is, this is the state of things in 2011 and 12, before Donald Trump even shows up on the scene in 2016. Okay, so I told you 2016 was typical, and we want to just take a moment to appreciate that, because we usually don't think of it that way. So how is it typical? State of the nation's economy always matters in presidential campaigns, the candidates always matter, and the messages in the campaign ads they send always matter. And all of these things mattered in 2016 in exactly the way that we would have expected them to. How about the economy? Here's the result. Incumbent parties and growing economies almost always win presidential elections. Okay, if you just knew what the change in the growth rate was, change in GDP, in the first six months of a presidential election year, and you said, if it's growing, the incumbent party will get reelected, how many times would you be right? You'd be right more than 75% of the time, slightly more. 
Okay, now I, I totally get that there's only two outcomes, and so like a monkey flipping a coin is right 50% of the time. But if you looked at GDP, you could be right more than the monkey flipping the coin 75% of the time. Okay, so there's this robust relationship, and this is what it looks like. So growth rate in the first six months of the election year and vote for the incumbent party in the presidential election, whatever, whether it's the actual person or not, the incumbent party. And you can see here all the, the years, but the, the line through these dots is uh, steep and sloping upward. So the better the growth rate, the better the incumbent party does. So here's 2012 just almost right on the line. We had a, a middling level of growth um, and a little bit of an overperformance by Barack Obama. But here's 2016. Slightly more growth than in 2012, but that thing is right on the line. The line is drawn without 2016 in there. Okay, 20, the 2016 election was exactly where we would have predicted based on this kind of robust and canonical relationship. And the key thing about this is that in this equilibrium where you have two serious candidates who are well financed, pretty equally financed, this, all these elections are like this, both want to win, in that equilibrium we expected, we can do this calculation in January. Right, sort of say, oh, what's the growth rate gonna be by June and make a couple guesses, it could be this, it could be that. But we can say like, hey, this election is gonna be close. And we did, we thought it was gonna be really close. Um, we knew the growth rate, we knew we weren't gonna be out here. Okay, you know that in January of 2016 and you know you're not gonna be over here. So we, everybody thought it was gonna be close but then Donald Trump sort of emerged as this super unusual candidate. He was breaking all these rules and I think everybody thought, well, we're not in this equilibrium relationship. So this close prediction, we can discount that because he isn't like all these other candidates. He's changed the equilibrium. Um, of course, uh, the popular vote Yes, the election is right on the line, but the popular vote and the electoral college vote are opposite. So we can talk about that a little bit in the Q&A, but in terms of the dynamics of the election and it being close, that was not a surprise. And so since neither party was gonna benefit from the state of the economy, we weren't booming, but we weren't crashing, both candidates had to sit back and say, what can this election be about that I can benefit from? How can I refocus? off of the election and onto something else, some alternate issue. That's the challenge for candidates. It's not just any issue. The issue has to meet three basic criteria. It has to be an issue with lopsided public opinion. Just like with immigration in 2012, you don't win by refocusing the election onto an issue where you and your opponent take the same position and uh, the public opinion is 50-50. Or you could even take opposite positions. If public opinion is 50-50, that you don't wanna reset the election onto that. You need to reset the election onto 60-40, right? You, and you have to be on the side that benefits. Right, so you refocus it onto a lopsided issue, but you better be closer to most voters than the other guy. Sometimes candidates get this wrong. I'll let you guys think about Barry Goldwater. Okay, so sometimes they get it wrong. It's not easy, this is hard. Um, and it has to be an issue that either is or can be made to be important. And if you think about where they both ended up, these identity issues, Clinton with her stronger together message and Trump with Make America Great Again, they did, they did refocus the election onto these identity inflected ideas. Um, and uh, you know, they were issues that were always important. And so all they had to do was wake them up. So the uniqueness of Trump, how does he wake up these issues, um, in particular in a way that had the election been Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush, or Hillary Clinton, Marco Rubio, and she was out there with everyday Americans, if you remember, that was the slogan when she launched her campaign, everyday Americans working hard. Uh, and Stronger Together came a little bit later. But if that had been in the context of a Jeb Bush or a Marco Rubio, it would have maybe not been as exceptional maybe we wouldn't be talking about how that was an identity-based campaign. Um, but in the context of all the things Trump was doing, then both campaigns become about identity. Okay, so 
to refresh your memory, make America great again, Trump wove this in, in a lot of the same ways that Kennedy wove in the new frontier in the 1960s. Kennedy made that, you know, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s. He made that about the space race, exploring the oceans. He made it about education, our kids doing better than the Russians, about the arts, about music. He made that about everything, an all-out war for the future of the world with the Soviets. And Trump, in some way, does the same thing with his Make America Great Again with this identity inflection. So he's making it about security and safety. He's run, he ran ads about Islamic terrorists and um, guns, but also about in-group, out-group ideas. And sometimes, and he, he reflects that in his language, us, we, versus them or they, and sometimes the us he's talking about are the people in rooms like this who came to his rallies, and he would say they, and maybe he's pointing to the media platform, maybe he's pointing to the Black Lives Matter protesters, but for Trump there was always a they, there was always the other. And that language is what sets us in this identity frame. Then everything is viewed through this lens of, is this person in my group or out of my group? Okay, and you start feeling good about the people in your group and not so good about the people outside your group. Um, the in-group, out-group, and us versus them language also then, combined with the Make America Great Again slogan, so the again is really important, right? America was once great, but is not now great, but could go back to being great. Oh, and by the way, um, we don't want any radical Islamic terrorists, and we need to keep our guns, and the press are bad, and the protesters are bad. Okay, so when that all gets woven up together, then questions about citizenship emerge. What does it mean to be an American? Who is an American? Who should be allowed to become an American? And so these questions then all get wrapped up in his presidential campaign. And people respond. Okay, so this basic question of what does it mean to be an American, what kind of country do we want to be, becomes the central dividing uh, rift in this campaign. So I'm going to show you what the data, how the data tell us that. Okay, so uh, again, here are a lot of pictures that are going to look like this. Vote for Trump or the Republican is always going to be on the y-axis. Here on the horizontal axis, I'm showing you how unique Donald Trump is on this dimension relative to other Republican Party nominees, Romney in 12 and McCain in 8. This picture is about people's um, attitudes toward a path to citizenship. Do you favor a path to citizenship or oppose it? And you can see that for Mitt Romney, there's that flat line, immigration not, not playing any role in, um, in that 2012 campaign, basically no relationship for McCain. But for Donald Trump in 2016, if you opposed a path to citizenship, you were much more likely to vote for Trump than if you favored it. Okay, so that issue is lighting up in 16 in a way that it didn't in 12 or 08. Same thing over here, attitudes toward African Americans just as a group, how do you rate the group? More favorable ratings, less favorable ratings. If you have lower favorability for African Americans as a group, and Romney, McCain, flat line, no difference. But for Donald Trump in 2016, you're 40, 40 points more likely to vote for him than if you have a favorable view down here. So these, this is an unusual election. Okay, these issues are, have, the attitudes have been there. Okay, but even these two gentlemen running against a black man, right, these racial issues are not being lit up by Romney and McCain. They are being lit up by Donald Trump because of what he is saying, because of all the Make America Great Again, Us Versus Them rhetoric. 
Here's another picture, um, again, Romney and McCain. Now I've got on the x-axis here, your favorable rating of Muslims as a group, low ratings, high ratings, and you can see flat line for McCain, but this um, steep relationship for Trump, again, that's a 30-point change in the probability of voting for Trump. Here is a thermometer rating of Muslims. So again, just another way to show the rating of the group as a whole, a thermometer goes from zero to 100. Um, and again, for Romney in 2012, flat line. And for Trump, the re same relationship. So it's not happening for McCain and Romney. Uh, McCain, yes, McCain and Romney, but it is for Trump. So what about 2016 specifically? So I've shown you that he doesn't look like other Republican nominees. He's unusual. He's also unusual among Republican candidates. Okay, so in 2016, um, we'll, we'll, start with, we'll start with past, uh, past nominees. So here's 2004 general election, 2012 general election, and then 2016, and you can see that's the one that's different. These are white voters only, but this question is asking, do you think whites are discriminated against? No, or yeah, I think that happens a lot. Okay, so you can see white discrimination or thinking about whites as a group that might share something um, like discrimination, not playing a role in four and 12, but there it is in 2016. And then over here, a somewhat different question. Um, do you think discrimination against whites is as bad as discrimination against minorities? I strongly disagree, I strongly agree. Now these are the same people so this is a really interesting picture. These are the people I told you about who I interviewed in 2011 and 12, and again in 16. So these are uh, just white voters in all, it's the same people in 12 and 16. So you can see a slight relationship in this relative discrimination question in 2012, but a much bigger relationship in 2016 um, for the Donald Trump election. Okay, and again, those are the same people. Um, so here now, we'll look at, um, again, favorability ratings of blacks as a group. And what if we ask people about Hillary Clinton in 2016 versus Cruz or Rubio, some of the other 2016 candidates? Um, relatively, you know, flat, maybe a little bit of a relationship here in the, in the line. But for Trump, a much steeper relationship. It's help, helping people conceive of these choices, these identity um, attitudes. And then the same thing over here, if we control for things like party and ideology and demographics like age and education. So seeing if we can break the relationship. We're, what if this is all about education? Or what if it's all about gender? It's not. When we account for those things, the relationship still looks different in 2016 than it does, or sorry, uh, for Clinton versus Trump than it does for Clinton versus Rubio or Cruz. Okay, and last picture like this, um, just to, in case you don't uh, see the relationship yet, the last one. So what I'm showing you here now, same thing, different matchups, Clinton Rubio, Clinton Trump, Clinton Cruz, Clinton Trump, Bush, Trump, and then this is Carson and Trump. And on the x-axis now, I'm showing you um, a sort of unusual measure, but this is again a scale of four questions about whiteness. These, are, uh, these pictures are for white voters only. And the questions are things like, um, do you think that whites are losing jobs to minorities? Um, do you think whites should come together to pass laws that are good for whites? How important is it to you that you're white. Now those questions, the first time I read them, they sounded odd to me, um, mostly because I really never thought of whites as a group of people that I had a fidelity to. But the point of this measure, and there's been a lot of work on this going um, in the last like three years, is that increasingly in America, whites are seeing themselves as a group that has similar interests that need to be protected. And so, least amount of what we call white group consciousness, that's the very academic-y label for this, um, least amount and most amount. And you can see people who have high levels of this white group affect 
they are much more likely to vote for Donald Trump than the people who have low levels of this. Um, and for these other candidates, for Rubio and Cruz and Bush, there's just no relationship between white group affect and vote for those other Republican candidates. And then obviously for Carson, it's uh, in the opposite direction. Okay, so this isn't a Republican thing. This isn't even a 2016 Republican thing. It's a Donald Trump thing because of what he said. Okay, now last but not least, wasn't it really about class um, or education? People tell me this all the time. And the answer is yes, but no. Yes, you can see very clearly in all the data, if you look on the New York Times, if you look at Real Clear Politics, that education was important in this election. Okay, but it is important because it is a way um, that neatly categorizes people's racial attitudes. So if you think back to where we started with those graphs of the non-college educated um, ability to place the Democratic Party on equality, okay, so keep that in mind as I show you these pictures. So what I've got here now on the horizontal axis is just your education level. High school diploma, college graduate, same over here. So um, this is, again, vote intention for Trump among white people. And you can see that when there's no controls in the model, just like what is the relationship between education and vote, that it looks like there is a relationship here and a pretty big one. Okay, if you have a college degree, you're much less likely, 20 some, 30 some points, to vote for Trump than if you don't. That's the result everybody knows about. Right, people, oh, the working class, the white working class. It's not about working class, it's about education levels. So white non-college educated voters went for Trump more than college graduates. But it's not even about education. Because when we control for your views on immigration and race, that relationship with education goes away. So it's flat. So what this picture is telling us is that Education is a marker for your racial views. But what's really driving the 2016 election is not just that you don't have a college degree or that you went to college, it's what is associated with that in terms of racial attitudes. What about jobs in the economy? That's the other thing people always say to me is like, this is wrong, it's not about identity and identity inflected issues, it was just about jobs. Well. It's also the case that the way people were thinking about jobs um, and help from government in 2016 was refracted through identity. So this is a little experiment that we ran to try to get at this idea to show this sense of deservingness. What this is, we made up this word, deservingness, um, that you read this everywhere in 2016 in the long form journalism, in the New Yorker and the Atlantic, that they would go to these places and they would talk to white voters who were voting for Trump and they would say things like, um, those people are cutting in line. I've worked hard my whole life, I've waited in line and now they're cutting in front of me. They don't deserve that job or they don't deserve that help. We wanted to try to see if there was anything to that. Could we see that in the data? So what I'm showing you here is an experiment that we ran. Where This is a, a, a sort of famous question. Um, have in the, in the last several years, have blacks gotten less than they deserve? That's the question that the American National Election Study has been asking since the 1970s. So we asked random, uh, a random set of people that question, and the other random set, in the past few years, have average Americans gotten less than they deserve? Okay, so in the sociology literature, the, an average American is pretty clearly demonstrated to be, in almost everyone's mind, a white person. Okay, so this is really a question that is gonna tap into identity. Okay, and in the whole sample, you can see these are the results. So in the last several years, have blacks gotten less than they deserve? 32% um, said yes. But in the sample that got the have average Americans gotten less than they deserve, 57% said yes. Okay, so there's in the full sample, there is a divide between what groups people think are sort of getting the shaft. 
Okay, and average Americans are paying a, more of a price than blacks. And then I've got it broken out for you here by race. So among white respondents, it looks pretty, pretty similar. 28% say blacks have gotten less than they deserve, but 58% say average Americans have gotten less than they deserve. Among our black respondents, it's roughly equal. Okay, but then here, Trump voters and Clinton voters. Okay, and so the interesting thing here is the Trump set. So among Donald Trump voters, only 12% said blacks have gotten less than they deserve, but a whopping 64% saying average Americans have gotten less than they deserve. Okay, so even questions about government helping people with jobs and job discrimination, losing jobs, um, are tied to this, what we call in the book, sense of uh, white grievance. Okay, so even economic perceptions are linked to white grievance. It's, it's far too simplistic to say that voters' choices in 2016 were about prejudice, or I don't even like to use the word racism. It's much more complicated and nuanced than that. Um, that would be a blunt treatment. The way that Donald Trump's Make America Great Again whoa, sort of trickled down through the whole campaign across all the issues makes the story much more nuanced, right? It's about, have you worked hard? And do you see someone else who hasn't worked hard getting a leg up from government when it comes to jobs and the economy? Um, so especially relevant for white Trump voters, whether they believed that hardworking white Americans were losing ground in America to minorities who were less deserving. That's a big part of the story. Okay, so what do we do with all of this? Oh, here, here's just a great quote from one of these um, long form uh, stories I was talking about from The New Yorker. So, you know, this is classic uh, magazine journalism. They go into some small town, but they're talking to Jesse, and he says, I see the government bending over backwards to help other groups, immigrants, minorities, while ignoring the people hurting in my community. They worry about making everyone else happy. I feel forgotten. Okay, so I feel forgotten, and, and that shows up in, this isn't just The New Yorker going to find a guy who would be a good story. It shows up in different public opinion data sets when we ask the question in all sorts of different ways, including the little randomized experiment that I just showed you. Okay, so back to Rakeem Jones and Quick Draw McGraw. Here's another thing that Rakeem Jones never saw coming. At the end of their trial, John McGraw pulls, he goes to shake his hand, which was a surprise to Rakeem Jones, but he pulls him in close and he gives him a hug. And what you can see happening here is um, they're just about to hug. Okay, and John McGraw whispers in Rakeem Jones's ear, this is months, this is like nine months after the election now, a lot of time has gone by. And he whispers in Rakeem Jones's ear and he says, it's up to you and me now. We let a bad thing happen, but we have to heal this country. Okay, now we could have a long conversation about we let a bad thing happen, but, um, but the sentiment is that it just reinforces the idea that, you know, John McGraw is not a man who every day goes around hitting people. Um, and so he was uh, activated by the rhetoric in the campaign and, re and regrets it. He never apologized to Rakeem Jones. I want to give this talk, people are like, you know, he never apologized. He didn't. Quick Drama McGraw never apologized. Um, and that was a very big deal to uh, Rakeem Jones and to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but he did express regret. Um, and so what do we do uh, with all of this when we think about the future? The, the, even, the, even the slideshow doesn't want to go to the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't make us. Hmm. Um, Okay, well, here's, 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 here's the last thing. Um, so, that's fine, it's fine, it's just, it's just, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so here's, here's the last thing. Um, what happens next? 
Okay, and presidents are usually pretty influential in uh, creating a party image. So one possibility is that Donald Trump establishes the Republican Party going forward as the party of white identity, the party of white group consciousness and white group affect. That is a very, very different Republican Party than Rance Priebus and the people after 2012 who wrote a more than 100 page task force report for the future of the Republican Party, having lost in 8 and 12. It was called the Growth and Opportunity Project Report. Um, and the takeaway of that report was we cannot become the party of white Americans because we will lose. Okay, now Donald Trump just demonstrated that you can win and become the party of white Americans. And so the question going forward is, what is the next, well, I, I, hate to, I hate to break it to you, but Donald Trump probably is the next Republican presidential candidate too, but the one after him. So what does the next non-Trump Republican candidate do? Um, and what do they do on these identity issues in particular? And I don't think we know. Um, and uh, it's particularly important because this politics of white identity, as we've seen, as you see in the John McGraw, Rakeem Jones story, is a particularly divisive politics. Um, and so what happens next is sort of where I'm going to leave you and entertain your questions. Okay, we take some. Uh, we'll start taking questions. When you, if you have a question, raise your hand, stand up, and um, Jay and I will alternate between the left and right hand sides of the room so everybody has a chance. I was wondering. I was wondering if there's a similar study. Um, asking questions about attitudes toward women. Uh, assume, say the last part again, asking what about women? Attitudes toward women oh, attitudes is determinative women. of the tendency yeah. to vote for Trump. Yes, um, we do have a part of the book about attitudes toward women. Um, that is, as you, you know, rightly saw, notably left out of my identity conversation here today. It is not left out of the book. Um, but the reason that I don't have it in the talk is that it is not nearly as clean of a story. Um, I, I can't really make pictures like this about attitudes toward women because they don't have the same relationship to the Trump vote. Um, so, you know, does that mean that gender didn't play a role in 2016? No. Uh, you know, we can talk about a lot of ways that it probably did. But it doesn't have this kind of obvious role in terms of um, how people view women and their vote for Donald Trump. Um, we can see it in, so I'll tell you what I mean by it's not as clear. Um, we see it in one data set, but not in another. And it's not just like half the data sets show it, half the data sets don't. Um, in some data sets, the relationship is strong, and in, in even the ones where we see it, it's much less strong. So these results that I've shown you about race and religion and ethnicity and citizenship, the relationships are stark and strong in every data set we have, and we have about seven data sets. Um, but the gender one is harder. It's mushier in some way. It could be the questions are bad. Um, so it's just a little bit of a more, it's a more difficult story to tell. Yeah. Question. A question. How does your data correlate to uh, general trends regarding uh, generic uh, desire for change? And with regard to turnout, how does it correlate to uh, uh, passion uh, 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 versus fatigue? Okay, so a desire for change and uh, passion versus fatigue. So. You know, um, I wake up a lot of days thinking, what if it hadn't been, you know, Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side? Um, so that's one way that I think about, did, what if the party had nominated a younger, more exciting, like a Barack Obama kind of nominee? Um, these questions are all very difficult, because we can't rerun the election with other candidates. Um, 
I think that one of the things that we can see in the data is that uh, black turnout for Hillary Clinton was down relative to where it was for Barack Obama. Um, if you talk to, you know, some people will tell you that is about the things that she and Bill Clinton did and said in the 1990s. Some people will tell you that is just about her being white. Um, I don't think we, we can't know the answer to that. Um, other than to say that I think the Clinton campaign knew that was going to be an issue. They didn't think that they were going to have that level of turnout from the black community. Um, but they thought they were compensating for it enough. And it, I think the losses there were more than they had anticipated. Um, so in terms of fatigue and just, you know, what if it had been different candidates. Um, but on questions of just regular turnover, you can account for that in that economic relationship. Like, is it the case that after two terms, the party almost always loses? Okay, and you heard that a lot. Like, isn't it just time for a change? Um, well, the model actually, you, you know, there aren't very many cases with which to do that if you want to do the post-New Deal era. And so we've had a couple of elections where we've had the party in for two terms, and then, yeah, like the party usually loses the next time. Um, my own view of that is that that is more about what's going on in the economy in those moments and more about who the other side puts forward because they'll wait, right? Like if you're a Democrat right now who's interested in becoming president, um, Donald Trump is gonna, I, I hate to tell you, but I don't think he's gonna be impeached before, you know, I know people always are like, what, really? Um, but I think he's the, nom he's the Republican nominee in 2020. And so if you're a Democrat thinking about running for president, you have the choice. Do I run, want to run against the actual incumbent person in 2020 or do I wanna wait? until 2024 when it's essentially an open seat, right? Nobody really has the advantage of having the person in the, in the office. And my theory is you get better candidates when they think they have an equal chance. And so that's wrapped up in this whole idea of, oh, it's always after two terms you get a switch. Well, maybe you're getting a switch because that party is waiting to, p the talent comes out in those years. Wait till people finish. I can repeat the question too, because I can hear you. I, I was listening the other day to a podcast where Preet Bahara interviews a, an Egyptian physician who became a, a comedian in the United States. I can't think of his name, he's quite popular. And his message was that he was quite hopeful because his daughter, he lives in Los Angeles, his daughter goes to elementary school, and when he asks his daughter to describe his classmates, many of whom he could tell by their last names or were, were not white, her daughter describes them by the color of the barrettes they were wearing <laughs> or what sports they played, that, that it, she would never make reference to their color, their background, the, 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 the slope of their eyes. So my question is, is that unique to Los Angeles? Is that way off in the future? Is that a contraindicator to your study? Yeah. Um, that may be unique to Los Angeles. Um, you may have heard that California is like the, the place that has now set itself up as being, you know, the, the, the biggest example of not Trump's America. Um, but the, more importantly, just to speak about data a little bit more precisely, when, there are people who study young people, um, and in particular this post-millennial generation, whatever we call them, the mobile generation or whatever they're called. Um, and their racial attitudes are dampened a little, uh, maybe the same way that uh, people who were born in the 1960s have, a, have sort of 
less racial um, division than people who were born in the 1930s. So there is that trend continuing, but it isn't the case that these post-millennials have, have no racial attitudes. Um, in fact, they have much more than I think most people expected to see. Why is that? I'll just say a little bit about what the, the research on this um, indicates is that there are these set of attitudes that social psychologists call you guys, there's probably social psychologists in the room, I should let you guys explain this, um, but they're pre-adult socialized attitudes. So you get them when you're very young, and you almost, I mean, it's not literal, but it's almost as if you inherit them from your household, from your parents, um, and your communities. And those uh, predispositions that are pre-adult are very, very hard to shake. Um, they don't change very easily. So it is the case that this, this newest generation has inherited those attitudes. They're not gone yet. Um, but if you take the super, super long view, you know, maybe eventually. You did indicate that you thought Trump would be the candidate for the Republican Party. No disagreement. However, do you feel that what we are seeing now fostered by the media and by so many others, including people in the Republican Party, that his base will remain as strong as it is now and that there will be no change in the election? Definitely. Um, I, it's not just his base. We have to, you gotta stop thinking of it as like this, you know, sort of like strange alien set of people, his base, that put him, no, Republicans voted for him the same way they voted for Mitt Romney and John McCain because party identification is very important. It's a signal about what is likely to happen in government. Um, and yes, Donald Trump was unusual in all these ways, but one of the typical, when I had that slide about how 2016 was typical and one of the things was the economy, but then it said party identification, election after election, 89, 90, 92% of people who call themselves Democrats vote for the Democrat and Republicans vote for the Republican. And in 2016, it was like 80 some percent. So it was a lot. There was some slippage, maybe a little more slippage, but the slippage kind of went the other way even. Um, more Obama voters switched to vote for Trump than we would expect. Okay, so uh, especially among white non-college educated voters. So it's, it's not just about the base. Okay, it is, and I think the base is, is there. Like that is not changing, but the, the re, let's call it the re-election set. Okay, the re-election set of Republicans who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, are they gonna come out in 2020? Yes, um, they are. And uh, I don't think there's much that could happen. Um, to change that. Um, when the man said I could walk out on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and I wouldn't lose any votes, um, he didn't literally mean that, but he has demonstrated that he, he can withstand a lot of things that a typical politician could not withstand. And that's important. I think it's important to appreciate that he's not a politician and that politicians have norms that they typically follow. Mitt Romney, John McCain, running against a black man, both of them on the record in different books and things, saying there are a bunch of words and phrases that we are never gonna say because we are not gonna be accused of playing the race card in these elections. Okay, so Donald Trump, clearly, that's not a tactic that he was going, and it's not a norm that he was going to observe because he's not a politician. And I think voters actually appreciate that. They hold him to a, to a different standard um, than this, this, you know, this poor set of politicians who are interested in the common good. And um, just, you know, this morning Donald Trump is out there, uh, you know, it was actually, a, it was a very reasonable conversation he had at this uh, UN um, press briefing. And he said, look, I'm a deal maker. That's what I do better than anybody, I make deals. And we're gonna get this deal done. Um, if we can have the conversation, we're gonna get a deal. If we can't have the conversation, we're not gonna get a deal. Um, there will still be an action. And I thought, you know, people, voters appreciate that, that he is not a politician. And so it's again one of the ways that 
you know, why it's difficult to imagine changes. I'm sorry, last thing I'll say about this. You mentioned the media. I think that's a really important element um, that the more mainstream and especially cable media, I don't want to say, well, we talked at lunch about how it's a, it's a little bit of a broken record. Um, what crazy thing happened in the Trump White House today? Um, and every day that that happens, I think, uh, it talk about like identity politics, in-group, out-group, us versus them. Every day that that happens, the people who are Trump voters, who may not have had an identity as Trump voters to begin with, now feel that they are a group who all have something in common defending that Trump White House. Um, so I think that's not helping either. Hi, I'm assuming that another lopsided issue is abortion. Have you done any studies on that? Yes. Um, so uh, abortion is an interesting uh, case when we think about how it plays in terms of politics because it isn't the case that voters are divided. So most voters are in the middle. Um, sh shouldn't always be illegal, shouldn't always be legal but should be legal under certain circumstances. And for the most part, if you give people a long list of circumstances, they pretty much agree, regardless of which party they're in. Right? No, nobody will tell you, well, I shouldn't say nobody, very, very few people will tell you that they think it should be legal for a woman to have an abortion just because she doesn't want another child. That question, even though if you think abortion should always be legal, that is, so you should, and people will say, do you think it should always be legal? Yes. Do you think it should be legal in this case? No. <laughs> so, you know, but when you give people the list of things, it's very, um, people agree on what those conditions should be. And very few people take the polar positions. Politicians, the parties on the other hand, only take the polar positions. So you can, if you're a voter, you can only choose, you know, one side or the other side, even though most people's positions are in the middle. Before, I think you mentioned that it's difficult to beat an incumbent, especially if the economy is doing well. And yet I remember that Jimmy Carter served one term. Many Democrats voted for Ronald Reagan. And years later, many Democrats unseated George Bush Sr. And I think the economy was doing well then. So could you please explain that? Yes, so you're talking about um, the 1980 election. So Jimmy Carter runs in, in 76 and then in 80, um, and actually the, the growth rate there is not positive. So that prediction is exactly what we would expect. Um, things are not going well and he gets kicked out of the White House. So that's a, that, that case fits the typology pretty well. I think that I heard you miss data did you so that it is that incumbents do well when the economy's growing that's the relationship and they they don't do well when it's not growing so in 76 it's not growing he's the incumbent he gets kicked out 2000 is um, I'm sorry uh, you said Bush senior in 92 um, so yeah it you know that's the sort of the famous election um, where poor George H.W. Bush went to the grocery store on what was, I'm sure, supposed to be a moment for him to reveal to everyone that he was in touch with the average American going to the grocery store. And he got to the, to the checkout counter and the clerk said, he's buying a, like a half gallon of milk. Um, and for, first thing that happened was the clerk scanned the milk over the scanner. How many of you guys remember this? And, George Bush said, well, isn't that a nifty thing? You know, wow, like he had never seen one before. Okay, so like, you know, you gotta feel bad for the guy, right? And then the second thing that happened is the price came up on the thing and it was, you know, whatever it was, two and a quarter or something, whatever the half gallon of milk was back then. And, um, and he said, well, that's expensive. <laughs> so he's just really not helping himself out. But the, but the point is that the 1992 election is a little complicated because the first few months we were in a recession, you guys, maybe you remember that. But then the economy started to really come back right as the election got close, sort of summer into fall, the economy's coming back. But 
it's too late. So one of the weird things about this economic relationship is that it's those first six months, January to June. And January to June of 1992, we were still feeling that recession. Uh, Lynn, with the drop off in the number of whites, the sheer uh, 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 demographic drop off, where is the Trump model going? I mean, it sounds like a single factor question, but I guess it seems to me that the clock is ticking against the white identity party, whether it's led by Trump or not. Any thoughts yeah. on that? No, I think that that's, you know, that is sort of the math, right? That's, that's not special math, that's just math. Um, whites are becoming a smaller share of the population, of the voting population in America. Now, you have to resist the urge to buy into the demography is destiny story. So many people after 2012, political scientists, high end political reporters, long form journalists were out there saying, you know, going forward, American politics is all about demography. Republicans cannot win if they're only campaigning to white people. Okay, that could not have been more wrong. Right, so it's just important to say that out loud. People thought the Latinos would very naturally go to the Democratic Party because blacks are always solidly Democratic, so why, you know, there were lots of reasons to think that that was true. Um, the Latino population is actually quite diverse. Uh, national origin plays a large role there. Uh, cultural context plays a large role. But I think that, um, how soon that's coming, I don't know, but it's obvious, right? The math just suggests that if you're going to be a party that survives, let alone thrives, uh, at some point you will not be able to win by only appealing to white voters. Now, I think what everybody didn't appreciate about what could happen is that all those white voters who voted for Barack Obama could be stolen back right, by a Republican. And they certainly didn't imagine, sh sure, like another global financial crisis with, you know, coming out of a Democratic presidency, yeah, maybe people swing over to the Republican Party. But nobody imagined that you could win that many white voters back by explicitly campaigning on identity. Um, and I think that's, you know, if you, if you dial that up, can you get more white Democrats? Can you get all of the white non-college educated voters to become Republicans? Like that could go on for a long time. Um, so, so I think just you know the demography as destiny thing needs to really slow down. Some people say that uh, political identity is in decline, and they point to the fact that the approval of Congress is less than anything. And uh, Donald Trump, before he became the nominee, he had to beat 15 or 16 party Republicans. And he swept it against all of them. So maybe uh, the question here is not what the, the identity of the voters of Trump, but <clears throat> whether or not the next time uh, that someone competes against uh, um, Trump, is he a politician or not? If he's not a politician, it's a different debate. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I've never actually thought about that. What if, uh, you know, even in the Republican primary, um, you get a non-typical politician to run against Trump, or if in 2020 the Democrats nominate someone who is not a norm-abiding typical politician. Um, gosh, I gotta tell you, there's a part of me that thinks that's so exciting, and I, I, wanna, I want a front row seat for that one, but then there's a part of, uh, this, maybe the same part of me says, oh, God, please don't let that happen. <laughs> you know, like we're just not ready um, for the norms to be violated on both. I don't know. The one thing I will say, though, about the beating 16 other people, um, I was just at a meeting with a bunch of um, you know political consultants and and fancy political people who talk to candidates, um, and I tried to encourage them to think about ways to limit and coordinate the field in primaries. Um, and to me, like the only way to do that is for there to be you know, party leadership intervening in 
putting those sets of people together now, like for 2020 now. And yes, that sounds horribly undemocratic. Like I wanna take the power away from people and give more power to party leaders. But I think part of the problem is there were 16 other people standing on those debate stages with Donald Trump. Not a single one of them lit up any of these attitudes. Um, and he did. And he got all of the people for whom that was attractive, and the other 16 split the rest. And I wonder every day, what if it had just been Donald Trump and Marco Rubio, or Donald Trump and Jeb Bush, or Donald Trump and Ted Cruz? Um, maybe Trump would have still won the nomination, but I, I don't, I'm not sure. So I think coordinating the field is important. Just a just quick thing. Um, Clinton unseated Bush because of Ross Perot. Sorry, I, I, Clinton oh. unseated Bush because of Ross oh, Perot. Oh, Ross Perot, yes, yes. So, you know, this is the big the sort of exciting thing in, in Washington circles now is what will John Kasich do? Um, and, you know, he's, he flirts every now and then with he's going to run as an independent in 2020. He knows he can't win, but he would siphon off votes from Trump. Um, I don't think he's going to do that. Again, party, party, party. Um, have, you, have you ever taken any of your data and separated to the so-called fly, flyover states versus the east and west? Because it's almost two different countries. So what about geography? Um, it's not so much middle of the country and coasts, although those places are very different. Um, those places are very different because of all the reasons that we all know, the ideology and urban rural. But even more interesting is within some of those middle of the country states. So places like Michigan and Wisconsin, um, even Pennsylvania, the three states that if Hillary Clinton had won 77,000 more votes in those three states, she would have won the Electoral College. So, you know, Michigan, for example, Macomb County versus the more urban areas, um, can you see real attitude differences in the data? Now, there's not a lot of data that gets to a point where you can look at voters from Macomb County versus, you know, Waukesha County or other counties in Michigan. So we, that would take a tremendous amount of data that, quite frankly, um, we don't have. Campaigns may have better data because they do the daily tracking polls. Um, they don't do it everywhere, but they do it in places where they think they're, you know, on the edge. They don't share those data with us, unfortunately. Um, but you can, you can see parts of geography that are very interesting um, in all kinds of public opinion data. So for example, Iowa. So Iowa um, supported Barack Obama, but really didn't support Hillary Clinton. Okay, and really by like double digits, right, a lot. So, and that wasn't something that happened in the last 10 days, that was something that happened in 2015. So they knew that Iowa was, something happened in Iowa. Okay, so if you're the Clinton campaign and you can see you're down 20 some points in Iowa from where Barack Obama was. Okay, you write off Iowa. I agree with that. That's, you know, you don't need a PhD to do that. But the thing that I think is interesting is that nobody sort of stopped and said, what is it about Iowa? What do we think that is? Um, and is it something about the context there that probably doesn't stop at the state border? And what about those Iowa adjacent counties to the north, you know, to the east? Um, and might we be in trouble in those pockets of those states? And I think I would have gone in with a real magnifying glass to those Iowa, the things that looked the same as Iowa in those other Midwestern states around there. Um, and I think they are, you know, they got a little surprised by what happened in those rural and um, sort of suburban areas of those states. And that division is real. So it isn't, like the coasts in the middle of the country, that's, you know, we kind of, that's old news. But what's new news and sort of interesting news is what's happening in urban versus rural areas everywhere. Um, and that is, uh, that's gonna really be a focus of 2020. You will see lots of attention paid to that. It, 
do you th do you think that the uh, campaign by the Koch brothers and their associates had any cumulative effect on the election and or were you able to evaluate any of that uh, in your yeah, I'm just going to ask you to repeat analysis. The, the campaign by the uh, Koch brothers. The Koch brothers. Because <laughs> it sounded like you said Oprah. And I was like, Oprah. Okay. Okay, the Koch brothers. You can see Koch brother, Oprah. You can see. Um, okay, so what about those uh, independent expenditures, as, as they're fondly referred to in Washington? Um, so what has happened since Citizens United is that although technically there is no coordination between independent expenditures and the candidates, um, the independent expenditures have picked up a heavy lift in terms of advertising. And um, that was true in 2012, it was relatively true in 2016. What ends up happening is that you still, remarkably, with all this lack of coordination, end up in a very balanced scenario. In 2012, the candidates ran almost the exact same number of ads, spent almost exactly the same amount of money, candidates plus their IEs. In 2016, obviously, Trump advertises and spends a lot less than Hillary Clinton. So the Koch brothers in 2016 is complicated because they do not campaign for Trump in the primary, um, and then they do not really campaign for him in the general. So they're not so much a factor in 2016. Um, if you're interested, though, in the Koch brothers and the Mercers and the role that they did play in 2016, I'll plug for you an excellent book, the best book on 2016 that I've read, called The Devil's Bargain by Josh Green. Um, it will tell you the whole story about the Cokes and the Mercers and Steve Bannon. Um, the book is really about Steve Bannon and how he meets Donald Trump and what that relationship is like. But the Mercers and the, and the Koch brothers are sort of supporting candidates. Um, really good book. We alternate sides. What if uh, the Democrats campaigned on a different identity issue of class? of the working class, and uh, Trump being obviously a, a not of that class, and uh, ran a Bernie type campaign against in him. In 2016, yeah. In 2016, in yeah. 2020. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, strangely, I think that the Clinton campaign's first instinct of everyday Americans was probably the right instinct. And some of this would have come out, I think, in that they were very sensitive to like a whole bunch of public opinion polling showing people don't want to be called middle class and they don't want to be called working class. That those, are, those don't mean the same things that they meant when middle class meant moving to the suburbs, buying a really nice car, putting your kid in a really good school. Now middle class is associated with being underwater on your mortgage, you know, your kid in a crappy school. So, so it, it, they mean different things, so they don't want to use that language. So the language they came up with to speak to that was everyday Americans. They, they abandoned that after maybe six or eight weeks in the summer of 2015 when it, was, it wasn't resonating very well and people thought it was, it was pejorative. Um, but my, my guess is that if they had stuck with that, their messaging, if she could have then been disciplined enough to stay on it, their messaging would have been more about jobs and creating a culture in these communities that was about hope and growth and doing better um, than just basically pointing at Donald Trump and saying, that guy, really? You know, which is where Stronger Together went. Um, and it's hard, to, it's hard to say that if you were in that same position, you wake up and Donald Trump gets the Republican nomination and he's out there saying bad things about women and saying, if he's saying all the things he's saying, it would be hard to imagine that you don't wake up thinking the same thing they did. Like, how did we get this lucky? Like, how could we lose to this guy? I think that would have been a very easy thing to think. Um, but I think that there's traction in that message. Yes. Yes. Um, 
You've been talking about uh, Trump's victory like, okay, you know, it's a done deal. It was a cliffhanger. It was an absolute cliffhanger. 100,000 votes in three states would have made the difference. Yes. And um, there is the assumption that somehow that whole advantage is being consolidated in our electoral system regardless of changes like redistricting, which has been already important in Pennsylvania, um, uh, uh, and other kinds of mobilizations of voters uh, that are not part of the white majority. Mm -hmm. You know, it, have you anything to say that might suggest that these things could, in the f immediate future, before 2020, play more of a role? Yeah, it's a great question. So. You know, 77,000 votes in three states, 10,296 votes in the state of Michigan. There are lots of ways to see how Michigan could have flipped. H higher black turnout in Detroit. Totally imagine that. The other states is, is harder. 44,000 votes um, in Pennsylvania, 22,000 some in Wisconsin. Um, you're not flipping that with just turnout uh, of, of a demographic group. So the question is, um, was that a fluke? You know, those, this is such a small number of votes. Um, yes, redistricting, but for the Electoral College, it is what it is, right? So, you know, redistricting is one thing, but when we're talking about presidential elections, where the district lines are drawn is, is largely irrelevant. Okay, so um, what do I make of all this? Like, you know, on the one hand, it's a squeaker of an election, it is super close. And, but for 77,000 votes, it would have gone the other way. And would we be having an entirely different conversation? That's a question. Most people think we would be. I'm not so sure, but okay. So it's a really close election. But the second thing is, um, do we just want to write that off and say it was a really close election? Let's fight harder next time and try to shore it up. Um, and I think that's where the Clinton campaign is culpable for the loss. So it isn't a fluke, okay, so because of that Iowa thing I just talked about. Um, is it likely to go back to where it was in the Obama years? No, it's going the other way, okay? And Trump pouring gasoline on these attitudes and waking them up only suggests it's amplified going the other way. Okay, and that is why, why? Okay, so why is that happening? This goes back to what Peter just said. The, the face of America is literally changing. So why is all of this activating? Um, you know, why can Trump push on these attitudes? Now I showed you that they always play a role, but at the immigration attitudes and the Muslim attitudes, that's all contextual. Okay, so that's post 9-11, and that is the fact that whites are becoming a minority in the country. That's not changing. So, you know, you really want to pay attention. If you're a candidate thinking about the future, um, a Democratic candidate, you, you know, you really can't go back to the Democratic Party in the 1990s or the early 2000s, because the country's really different. Um, I was just at this meeting that I mentioned with some consultants and um, I was trying to again encourage them to have the party play more of a role and to really, you know, sort of make sure we get candidates who will respect these norms, these political, you know, campaigning norms. And they just, you know, kind of gave me a pat on the back and, and said, you know, oh, that's a really quaint idea. Um, and and, and kind of looked at me and said, you know, but this is it. And I said, what do you mean? And, and they said, well, this is, this is politics now. You know, this is what it's going to be. And I literally almost cried. Because <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect to hear that from them, just like you would not expect to hear that. Um, so I don't know. Maybe they're right. I hope that they're not. I hope that there are people who will respect the norms of decency. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We have two more here. And then we have uh, there was a, uh, an interesting article in the New York Times last Sunday. I can't remember the author's name, but the contention, he stated flat out that uh, Trump will be reelected in 2020, and the key factor he cited was the attitude of the Democrats. 
They are self-righteous. They look down on Trump uh, voters. They show no respect to these people. Uh, how key is that factor? Yes, that was on the um, opinion pages, a very well done piece written by a political science professor. Um, you guys should all, you should all look for it. It's an interesting read. Um, and um, I think that that's probably you know, that's probably a part of the story here is that, um, as I mentioned before, every time, you know, you, you have to be a little bit careful because you don't, you don't want to compromise what you believe in. Um, and I'm not suggesting that. But I mentioned earlier cable news. And so every time the cable news uh, segments, you know, repeat themselves and repeat themselves about what went wrong today in the Trump White House and is this the thing? Is this the thing that is going to, you know, that kind of thing, I think, um, is, is helping to identify the groups as I voted for Trump, I didn't vote for Trump. And that is not good. Right. Party identification has always been a, you know, we think of it as a social identity, an attachment, um, whether that meant in the 19, you know, 60s that you were a union person or in the 1980s you were a small business person. I say those characteristics to you and you know which parties those people were in. Right? It's always been that way, a little bit of an identity thing. But, we, but I worry that if we get to this point where the party identities are woven with race and ethnicity and religion, um, then really shoring up those voting and party identities um, is normatively a bad thing. Um, so yeah, I think that the author of that piece I was glad that the Times uh, published that because I think it was a good uh, reality check for um, a lot of people who view politics as entertainment. A lot of people do this. You know, you watch Anderson Cooper, you watch Don Lemon or Rachel Maddow or, you know, whatever you watch on Fox, and it's entertaining. And you like what you're hearing, just like you like to watch, we were talking about the Big Bang Theory at lunch. It's entertaining because you like it. Um, and that's fine, but just keep in mind that it's lighting up the other side. We have two final questions for you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to come back to the 216 election, yeah. which is the original talk. Uh, first of all, uh, the dark money mm -hmm. uh, has been supporting for decades the destruction of the Clinton family. They have like, they, they filed many, many suits against them, lost all of them, but it gave the impression that the Clintons were bad, bad choice. And then the Democratic Party goes ahead and selects Hillary Clinton. So that's number one. And that connects to me to the turnout. We had a turnout problem that was significant, because even if you talk about what people preferred and didn't prefer, many of them didn't vote at the end of the day. They didn't vote because they wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And then on top of it, we had the special Bernie situation, which further complicated everything. So I'm saying, I think b before we just talk about these statistics, I think we have to go back and understand the mistakes that the Democratic Party made so that they don't make those mistakes again. So I'd be interested in your comments. Um, yeah, just a little interesting thing about dark money. Um, since the advertising in 2016 was so unusual in that Trump didn't do very much of it, there was actually very little dark money in 2016, almost none. So strangely, you know, you wouldn't have thought that was going to be the case, but it was. Um, but we have a little section of the book about Bernie and comparing the Clinton to Obama support in 08 to the Sanders Clinton support in 2016. And your instinct is right that um, she lost uh, more Sanders votes than Obama lost Clinton votes in 08 but not profoundly so. Um, so uh, what comes through a little bit in the data is um, Sanders voters like to say that they will never vote for Hillary Clinton, they'll stay home and not do it, but they do. Um, and, and so I don't think that it's necessarily, um, you know, essentially I think what you're saying is, was she the wrong candidate to nominate? 
And there are lots of, we could think of lots of reasons. We could make a very long list of, you know, what if the Democratic nominee had been Biden? What if it had been, Bernie would not have won. I hate to, <laughs> I, I rarely make emphatic statements, but everything that we see is that he wasn't beating Donald Trump, okay? Um, but, you know, you might think about Joe Biden. Could he have, be, I don't know. Like, again, 77,000 votes in three states. Um, the way that the, the uh, you know, I'm not sure Biden would have won, to be honest with you. Um, but you could make a long list of reasons that maybe Hillary Clinton wasn't the right choice. Um, the counterfactual that I like to think about is, there was a moment in 2015 in like February where I was getting ready to write this book and I said like, oh God, like, it's gonna be Jeb Bush versus Hillary Clinton. It's Bush Clinton, it's the 90s all over again. And I thought, this is, do I really wanna write this book like this is gonna be torture, boring, you know? Um, and okay, now we didn't get that. But just the, the counterfactual thought experiment is, would Hillary Clinton be, have been seen as the wrong candidate if it had been Bush on the Republican side or Cruz? Um, and I think in a lot of ways, a lot of the conversation about the 90s would not have come up, certainly if it had been Bush, because they, they negate each other on the dynasty, you're so 10 minutes ago angle. <laughs> so it does matter who you're standing next to. Um, and, and it's hard for candidates to guess and to know who that's gonna be. It's hard for parties to know that. Um, Thank you guys very much for a very interesting, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry. I, I, I prematurely dismissed you from class. The last question. Okay, I will give a short answer. Yeah, no, this is just an aside, and that is, I think, nowhere has been mentioned, and my Republican friends comment that uh, there's a likability thing about, about Hillary Clinton, and there's probably no one that personified that unlikability more than Hillary Clinton of any candidate that's probably run before. But, but. Well, the good news is that nobody liked Donald Trump either, right? So, but, yeah. But, but my main conversation here is that in the primary, you heard these outrageous statements coming from Donald Trump and bullying his, uh, his, com his competition. And then in the general election, you heard more outrageous statements and you would have assumed that when he became president that he would become more presidential, okay? Instead, he has doubled down. So my question to you is, uh, given that he has given us a wealth of negative comments and tweets, et cetera, in which for any Democratic candidate, hopefully it's an attractive Democratic candidate, to attack, and also given that I have heard pundits saying that to win elections, you've got to be negative. What do you say the Democratic presidential candidate should do to take on Donald Trump? <laughs> yes, what a great question. What should the Democratic candidate do in 2020 if they're running against Trump? Um, the first thing is that like all of that stuff he's done, you just got to forget it all. It's not, it didn't work in 2016, it is relitigating he said he would grab a woman by the, like, it's not gonna make a difference. Okay, so we, we can't have more ads of, 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 you know, girls looking in the mirror while the track of Donald Trump saying, you're a fat pig, play in the background. Because that did not move the needle in 2016, and it is not going to move the needle in 2020. So the first thing is to just face the hard, cold truth of that. Um, and then the question I think is, you know, what's going on with the economy? If the economy is growing, it's, that's a tough nut to crack then. I, I would have to take a step back and, and really think. It would matter a lot who the Democratic nominee is. Um, you, I can imagine a lot, uh, a lot of things that a Cory Booker could do, for example, um, that um, an Elizabeth Warren couldn't do. So I think that it matters who that person is. Um, if the economy is middling, then I think you can, you go there, you go all there. He said he was a deal maker, he said he was a businessman, he has, you know, X number of jobs have left the country, blah, 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 but just economy, economy, economy. That's been a pretty good strategy for a lot of people. 75% of the time, if you hammer on that, you will win. Um, so, 
um, yeah, I think it matters who it is and the economy. That's who should it be? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll come back. I'll come back. Let's come back. Okay. Let's Lynn, come back. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Let's. We'll come back in 2019 and start again. Thank you.